This is the web transcription service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. In the first Security Studies luncheon of the fall 2012 season, held on September the 26th, we are proud to present the noted Canadian press foreign correspondent Murray Brewster, who covered Canada's engagement in Afghanistan from both the Kandahar and the Ottawa ends. Thank you very much for inviting me down to talk and to listening to me muse about uh, what is uh, inarguably my absolute favorite subject to talk about, which is uh, the Canadian military and um, the events of the last few years. The presentation I'm, about, uh, I'm going to give you is not going to be about Afghanistan, although I'm happy to field uh, questions about it afterwards. Uh, I think it's uh, important that we talk about uh, how the Kandahar combat mission has reshaped the Canadian military and where the Canadian military is going, uh, at least where I foresee it going in, uh, in the next few years, and also to talk about uh, some of the challenges. I'm going to keep it as, uh, informal because in just a moment I'm going to grab my, uh, my water and I'll sit because I'd like to, I like to move my own slides and I'd like to keep this kind of very much in, in the uh, in in the round table uh, fashion uh, and very relaxed. Uh, Chris was, uh, was was very kind in his introduction. Um, he has been invaluable to me as has the institute on many occasions when uh, I'm trying to turn into English or uh, at least take some of the things that uh, the, some of the Byzantine uh, practices or some of the Byzantine statements that are made at uh, uh, National Defense and turn them into English and uh, so that people actually understand and appreciate um, what is happening. And uh, uh, Chris has been very generous with his time and uh, generous with, uh, with his comments and I really do appreciate that. Um, the uh, just a couple of the uh, biographical notes, just, just to clear it up. Um, when I say that uh, hurricanes became a, a, a bit of a specialty, um, in one case, uh, hurricanes, uh, for my coverage, uh, it, it came to me uh, because I was in uh, Halifax for, uh, for Hurricane Juan, and uh, that uh, took up um, uh, quite a bit of time and was perhaps one of the most challenging and interesting experiences of my life. I even uh, compare it to my time in Afghanistan. Uh, in the uh, in the other case, uh, it was uh, Hurricane Katrina, which is uh, in that particular case, I had to go to the hurricane, and um, I ended up uh, traveling for almost two weeks uh, through uh, the wreckage of the uh, of the Gulf Coast uh, and New Orleans as well, uh, reporting on it for uh, Canadian press. Um, originally, I had gone down there uh, to um, to follow the Canadian Navy um, in its deployment of uh, humanitarian relief. Um, but uh, as with many things, uh, the uh, my embedding board agency is Toronto uh, got a little screwed up. And uh, so I had actually ended up ashore for, uh, for the whole time. And my experience in Halifax, where, where I spent 11 years, uh, saw me covering half my time covering national politics, the other half the time covering the Navy. And it was because of my time covering the Navy uh, and 9-11 to a lesser degree that um, CP felt that I was eminently qualified to cover the Army in a ground war in Afghanistan. Um, anybody who has spent any time in uniform will understand that there's a completely different culture. And, um, but uh, that wasn't entirely understood by uh, our editors at CP. And I would suggest to you that the media coverage that has built up over Afghanistan over the last uh, several years has been as much, as much as it was a learning process for the Canadian military to learn how to fight a counterinsurgency war in a landlocked country, it was a learning process for the Canadian media to rediscover how to cover Canadian troops in the middle of a shooting war. They covered uh, the deployment, uh, peacekeeping deployments or the, the twilight wars of, uh, of the former Yugoslavia. Um, but you know, Afghanistan was a, was, a, was a completely different beast in terms of coverage. And 
the uh, Canadian uh, media corps had to learn from scratch almost uh, how to do it because really there had not been that kind of conflict since Korea and there was coming out of Korea a rather battle-hardened cadre of Canadian war correspondents which when Afghanistan began had not happened. You had seasoned and veteran foreign correspondents who had covered other people's militaries in the middle of wars and conflicts, but never their own country, or very rarely their own country. And it was a, a very, speaking from the inside of the media, it was a very brutal learning experience for all of us. And I'm going to be the first to admit that in many instances we, we didn't get it right, but in many other instances, I would suggest to you that as much as the public should be proud of what the Canadian military accomplished in Afghanistan and proud of their soldiers, they should also be proud of the coverage that they received from Afghanistan as well. Because um, complaining about the media in a normal situation in Canada is sort of like complaining about the weather. Everybody has an opinion about the coverage. And what they see on television, what they read in the newspaper. I was having this uh, this, this conversation with, uh, uh, with, with Mark uh, just a few minutes ago. And it's very different on the inside. And you would be amazed at some of the uh, challenges that the journalists who covered Afghanistan uh, had to overcome you would be amazed at some of the ethical dilemmas that were posed by this mission and by the rather unusual set of security conditions that forced us into, uh, in my estimation, an uneasy uh, marriage, an uneasy relationship um, with the Canadian military that um, made us as uncomfortable as it made the military as well. But I'm, I'm happy to, to discuss that in, in, in detail a little further. Um, the, uh, the intent of today was to talk about uh, my, my capacity as the uh, defense reporter at CP, to talk about some of the things that, uh, that we've uh, learned from Afghanistan and um, some of the things, and, and just the sort of current environment and where I see it headed. Now, I'm happy to field questions after we're done. Um, you're going to get a heaping of facts with a dollop of uh, observers' opinions. Just as a uh, as as a point of pride, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that photograph that uh, you see I took on one of the last patrols that uh, joint patrols that uh, Canadian troops conducted in Zangabad with uh, with the Americans. And I'm quite proud of this particular photograph because it was front above the fold, one third of the Globe and Mail. Uh, the day after. So, let's look at Kandahar by the numbers. Approximately, throughout the five-year combat mission, 40,000 troops served in various capacities, either with the battle group or as part of the headquarters, or as part of the uh, uh, logistics trail. Now, there is a dispute between how, mu how much this has cost. If you look at official uh, national defense records right now, they'll tell you that the war in Afghanistan... I didn't have any music. <laughs> the, the war in Afghanistan cost roughly $9.3 billion. However, the Parliamentary Budget Officer maintains that even with accrual accounting, the uh, direct cost to DND uh, was $11 billion. Uh, there, is, there were 158 soldiers killed, but that goes th throughout the entire 10-year uh, conflict and does include the one soldier who was killed almost a year ago in uh, Kabul as part of the training mission. There were 1,859 wounded, uh, now that figure goes until the end of 2010, and uh, I will give you a, a, a very interesting side little story about that. Um, 
at the beginning of the combat mission, and it was written into the embedding rules that uh, uh, that the whenever there was a tick or troops in contact, uh, the uh, military public affairs officers, wherever the reporters were, whether it be them with a combat unit, be it at headquarters, uh, were to notify them about uh, about the incident and to let them know that troops had been wounded. That policy was quietly changed. Uh, in, well, originally it was, it was changed in 2007, but it was never enforced until uh, 2009, late 2009, early 2010, when uh, the National Defense Department moved to a system of not reporting wounded, uh, but only reporting them once a year in a statistical release um, that, was, that was done, um, that it would, would have been done out of National Defense Headquarters. And um, I wrote about it and kicked up uh, uh, quite a fuss about it uh, because I happen to very strongly believe that it presented a uh, skewed view of the conflict, especially in 2010 and 2011 when the number of wounded were outstripping the number of, uh, uh, of killed. And it gave the impression of a bloodless conflict. And um, I had quite the heated debate uh, with, uh, with the uh, task force commander uh, um, about it at the time, and I still stand by it um, because I, ab I absolutely believe uh, that it was a disservice uh, to, the, to the troops in the field uh, to not report uh, when, they were being, uh, when they were being attacked and when they were being wounded. And I had a very vivid demonstration of that in the fall of 2011, when, excuse me, in the fall of 2010, when I was with uh, the RCR Battle Group, uh, Bravo Company, uh, uh, 1st Battalion, Royal Canadian Regiment, and um, I had soldiers at uh, a base called Soja, uh, Shoja, uh, complaining to me about the fact that uh, they were getting attacked just about every day and people were getting wounded and blown up and nobody was writing about it. And I had to, t and I always keep all of my stories on my laptop, and I had to pull that lap, pull that particular story uh, up about the the ban on reporting on wounded, and show it to them. And they were simply appalled. The legacy of Kandahar. The positive side has been that for the first time in almost two generations, the army now has a cadre of battle-tested officers and NCOs on a wide scale. Um, there is, uh, and, and I've noticed this particularly in some of the academic research uh, that, that has been coming out in some of the papers that I see coming out of, uh, uh, of RNC, uh, there, is a, there is a completely different uh, tenor um, that, is, that, 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 is, that is quite evident. The tactics, trainings, and, uh, training, and procedures um, have been in many cases validated in the field. Um, I would also suggest to you that the lessons learned system for the Canadian military is now second to none. In some cases, incidents, IED incidents in Afghanistan were happened on one day and information and data was being analyzed in Kingston um, to make adjustments to uh, TTPs um, within 48 hours. It, 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 it was in many respects like simply amazing the, uh, the academic uh, learning and the learning that went on. Um, there has been, uh, in tandem with, uh, with the battle testing, um, there has been an experience in the, uh, gained in the Canadian military in counterinsurgency operations, counterinsurgency and whole of government operations. I'll leave whole of government aside for a couple of minutes. But... Uh, um, uh, the Canadian military uh, wrote its own counterinsurgency manual in, uh, in 2009. And uh, as someone who uh, studies these, uh, these different manuals, not necessarily looking for stories, but actually just looking, for, looking at it from an academic point of view, uh, if you hold it up against uh, the U.S. Marine Corps' uh, counterinsurgency manual and if you hold it up against uh, the U.S. Army's uh, counterinsurgency doctrine, uh, I would suggest to you that it stands uh, as an absolutely shining document 
Um, and it is, uh, it, it's something that, that the, at least the, the military itself uh, can be proud of. Um, also, too, uh, from uh, the point of view of just, uh, I guess, military operations, uh, the strategic lift uh, was added during the, uh, uh, the Afghanistan uh, campaign. Uh, I, I cannot underscore the difference that has made uh, long term to the Canadian Forces, the addition of the, uh, of, uh, the C-17 uh, aircraft. The burden of Kandahar, though. There are legacy of care issues, which I'm sure that some of you have been uh, reading uh, quite a bit about lately, um, including uh, a wave of PTSD cases that, um, in speaking with uh, several people, both um, past and present in the Canadian Forces health system, will tell you uh, has, yet to, has yet to hit. Um, there are other social issues uh, that are uh, part of it. I'm sure that you are aware uh, that, the, that uh, the federal government recently pumped $11.4 million into, uh, the, um, into the CF health system, specifically for care of, uh, of uh, PTSD and mental health issues. Um, there is, uh, there's quite a debate uh, going on within the system right now um, because um, uh, just last week the Canadian Forces Ombudsman released a report uh, that suggested that uh, the CF health system is, um, has not been able to meet its uh, goals that were stated um, back in the early 2000s in terms of the number of health care providers that are needed, the number of counselors, the number of social workers. Um, in the early 2000s, before the Kandahar campaign, uh, there was a goal set of 447 uh, psychiatrists and social workers, and um, for a variety of reasons, the government has never met that goal. And it is one of the reasons why the system is straining. And uh, in some actually some very high-level discussions that I had or talking with some very high-level sources last week, um, essentially what was said is the system, even though it got an, 11, an extra $11 million, really isn't in need of money as much as it is in need of, for lack of a better description, a bureaucratic enema, um, because it has been the uh, bureaucratic... Um, it, it, has been, it has been the bureaucratic uh, system which has prevented the hiring of up to 125 of the, um, uh, of the, need, the needed professionals uh, for the CF Health Services. Um, there's also, too, um, a burden that's been placed on the system. If you remember back in 2006, 2007, when uh, former Chief of Defense Staff General Rick Hillier um, changed uh, or modified the uh, universe, universality of uh, uh, service rules, which in very, very layman's terms, um, the changes meant that anybody, if you were wounded in Afghanistan, um, the military wasn't going to kick you out because uh, you were unable to meet your, uh, you know, uh, some of your universality of uh, uh, service conditions. And in talking to some people in the system, as much as that was uh, the right and compassionate thing to do, in the post-Afghanistan military, what that, is, what that has done has created um, a, a bubble of, of people who are, um, who are not deployable but also, too, don't want to transition or are unable to transition to civilian life. Um, at the same time, you have uh, Army vehicles that uh, many of them, uh, from right from Leopard tanks all the way through to LAVs and to uh, Nialas that are in desperate need of uh, a reset. At the same time, we have shrinking budgets. And I don't know if, uh, if you... If some of you have followed some of what I've been writing uh, lately, you'll notice that I've kind of zeroed in on the, the training budgets. And the training budget for the Canadian Army, as an example, went from $129 million in 2009, 2010 to $43 million this year. Now, that $129 million figure uh, did contain a substantial bump for Afghanistan, 
and that, that was specific to Afghanistan. Um, but that $43 million figure is roughly the same figure that was being spent in the early 2000s, if I can give, you, give it to you by, uh, by comparison. Um, and the other uh, effect of Kandahar is that some other branches of the forces have been starved for funding, and uh, some of their projects have been put off uh, because there, there is either, either no staff support or there's no money. Come on, come on, come on. There we are. Okay. Now, let's talk a little bit about um, the public's perception of Kandahar. Um, as I say, like uh, you find that I, I read quite a bit of, uh, of the academic research, but I also read an extensive amount of uh, internal uh, defense documents that I get either through access to information or through open source. And one of my, and my favorites, to be honest with you, are the public opinion polls and the uh, perceptions of the Canadian military that D&D um, &D does every year, every spring, every March, they do a public opinion survey. In 2012, they actually did two of them. But um, I don't think it's a secret to say that the Warren Kandahar sharply divided public opinion. Um, it remained, um, while there was a, an initial swell of support in early 2006, um, after we started encountering casualties, uh, the war uh, became very polarizing. And you saw uh, not a vast majority, but you saw anywhere the numbers fluctuate anywhere between 50 to 60 percent opposed to the deployment. And those numbers were consistent throughout the war. And through um, DND um, uh, polls, but also, too, through focus groups that many of the research firms did, they consistently showed that the public preferred their soldiers to be peacekeepers. Now, th those of you who spent time in uniform here, um, and I, I, and I will wholly agree with you when you say, I've heard often that peacekeeping, th there is a myth that has been built up around peacekeeping. Um, it was a very convenient uh, uh, political um, moniker to hang around the military in the 1990s at a time when the uh, Kretsian government was carving the guts out of, uh, out of the Defense Department. And, um, uh, it, it hit, but it, it has captured the public's imagination. And I can tell you, consistently reading the polls, it has been incredibly hard to dislodge that myth from the public's mind. And I use the word myth because um, I would suggest to you that after the fall of the Soviet Union, that uh, what Canadian troops were called upon to do was actually get dropped into the middle of some very nasty civil wars. And um, traditional Pearsonian peacekeeping, as far as I'm concerned, and I'm happy to debate this with anyone, died in the early 1990s. Um, uh, most popular in mean, public perception post combat mission in Afghanistan is, uh, uh, is humanitarian assistance missions. Uh, the public is, uh, is, is quite in love with that. Uh, I think that Haiti uh, and the response to Haiti captured uh, their, their imagination. And of course, the government uh, broke its arm, patting itself on the back as to how uh, it handled that. Um, also, too, in the latest research, and this is from the this is from the uh, the public opinion polls that were done this past spring, uh, where once the public thought the military was underfunded, it now believes that the budget is just about right. Um, and one thing that it sort of trickles through the research, but it, it's it, it's never it, it never quite crystallizes, is that there is a there is a growing public focus and awareness on the issues of returning soldiers, particularly PTSD and health care. And um, I think, I mean, in, in putting that extra $11 million into, uh, into military fund, into uh, military health care funding, I would suggest the government is also uh, getting the same impression from its research that I am. Um, Kandahar was, in my estimation, uh, 
a very political mission. Um, more political, I think, than just about anything that we've uh, seen, perhaps going back to the conscription crisis of the Second World War. That's just my view of it, but um, I would suggest, and, and I, I don't want to necessarily revisit all of the, uh, all of the, the political um, uh, machinations that went on and who opposed what or who favored what. Um, uh, commercial time, folks. If you'd like a little bit more of my opinion, you can read, read, <laughs> you, you can read the book. Read all of it. Yes, because, I mean, essentially the conclusion I came to in the book was that the war was um, unnecessarily politicized, um, and it was used as a political wedge issue, which um, I make no bones about saying it in here that I consider that to be uh, disgusting. Um, but uh, the, the effect of that, though, has... Um, I believe that Kandahar is making uh, not only the, con the, the current government, but I would suggest to you any future governments more cautious in committing troops to the ground. Um, I would honestly suggest to you that I will eat my hat if I see within the next decade or so Canadian boots on the ground somewhere. Um, I honestly do believe that uh, what we saw in Libya, and what we what we are see what we saw in Haiti, um, and I, I guess when I say committing boots to the ground, committing boots to the ground in in, in a in a war kind of uh, uh, or a combat kind of situation, I don't think there be there would be any hesitation in committing troops to a, another humanitarian mission. In fact, I think they'd be tripping over themselves to to find it. Um, but at the same time. There has been this uh, th this curious thing within the government uh, where it uh, is it, it desires to be seen to be leading on the world stage. And the two examples that I can give you is look at the big party that got thrown for uh, Lieutenant General um, Bouchard uh, on Parliament Hill after uh, the Libya campaign uh, was over. Um, there are many political reasons for that, but the government, I would suggest to you, uh, was desperate to celebrate some kind of, uh, of, of victory. Um, they can't do it with Afghanistan, um, and I would suggest to you they won't do it with Afghanistan even after 2014. Um, but uh, there is this desire to be seen to be, to be a player. And... Uh, there's a story that I wrote um, uh, about a year and a half ago about how uh, the, uh, the political establishment was desperate to get a Canadian admiral in charge, uh, and Canadian ships, in charge of the international force hunting pirates off the, uh, off the east coast of Africa. And it was... Like it was, it was just laced throughout all of these documents. How Canada, want, like you know, needed to be seen to be playing this this important leadership role. But ironically, one of the ghosts of Afghanistan uh, prevented uh, the government from fully committing to it because there is this whole legal debate going on right now. But once you capture a pirate, what do you do with them? Where do you try them? And, <laughs> and, uh, and so like, that, that, sort of, that sort of tempered uh, some of the discussions. Anyway, I found it to be an absolutely fascinating piece. The Globe and Mail liked it too because they actually gave it some, some quite good play when it, was, when it came out. Um, but, any, but coming back to uh, the list here, what Afghanistan has done is politically has, has nurtured a desire for quick, clean, politically acceptable campaigns, no casualties, no ramp ceremonies, like that, that's this is what the government uh, would like to see. I would also suggest to you that um, there was a sobering recognition of the cost, and I'm talking the dollars and cents cost of fighting a war and being part and, and, and just maintaining um, uh, a modern military. Uh, I. The conservatives, and I'll get into this actually a little further on in the slide, but the conservatives are very good about um, giving you the impression that they support 
the, the Canadian military, and they do. I mean, mm -hmm. they do with their words. But I find the reality behind the scenes to be uh, a little bit funny and a little bit sad and a little bit sobering. Because uh, I'll, I'll give you a, a very, very quick example. Um, in the 2005-2006 election campaign, the Conservatives promised to increase the size of the regular forces to 70,000 regular and 35,000 reserves. Um, a year after they came to office, um, that plan, without any fanfare, was scoped back to 68,000 regular force, 30,000 um, uh, reserves. And that was because they got into office and they saw how much it costs, what the lifetime cost is to, to keep a soldier. And um, in the Canada First Defense Strategy of 2008, the government said, well, we're going to hit 70,000. 70,000 regular, 30,000 reserves. Ladies and gentlemen, they have never hit that goal. They've come close to it, but because of attrition, they have never actually hit the 70,000 goal. And in fact, I don't want to... I don't want to... Um, propagate rumors here, but uh, one of the rumors going around Ottawa in, in terms of deficit reduction is that the forces will be scaled back reg force to 65,000. Haven't been able to confirm that yet, but, you know, it, it, it's, I mean, I'm sure you would recognize that Ottawa is, is a hothouse of rumors. <clears throat> Um, what's in store for defense policy post Kandahar? Um, there's a story that I like to tell in Ottawa um, on the defense beat, and for many of the young staffers who work for the government and who uh, work for, I, mean, I guess, all the political parties, uh, I like to tell them that I covered the last defense white paper that was put out. The last defense white paper was delivered by the Katsian government in 1994. There has not been a defense white paper since. Um, I would suggest to you, well, I mean, some, uh, some would debate with me and suggest that the Canada First Defense Strategy uh, was, a, uh, was a white paper. Um, I would challenge that and say to you that I would suggest that um, the Canada First Defense Strategy was really more a shopping list than it was uh, when it was an actual policy paper that laid out the uh, the threats that uh, that face uh, the country and how we would respond and justifies the purchases that uh, the government would have to make. I would suggest to you that a lot of our policy now and into the, at least into the immediate into the near term future is going to be uh, based upon political rhetoric rather than research. Um, I know that that's a bit of a, uh, an inflammatory statement, but um, I would suggest to you that uh, I, I'm quite certain in my, my opinion. Um, Peter McKay, uh, the defense minister, gave a speech uh, down in, uh, at the Naval, U.S. Naval Postgraduate School uh, earlier this year where um, he laid out what I would, what I consider to be, and the speech wasn't very well covered. Um, I mean, I wrote a little bit about it, but the story just kind of like people didn't seem to to grasp, uh, or at least the editors in the different uh, publications didn't seem to grasp the significance of it. But he was essentially uh, suggesting where Canada's um, po defense posture has been, as far as I'm concerned, largely reactive um, for the better part of the last four decades at least, um, he was signaling a, a much more proactive uh, position where he believes that Canada should be among the leading nations to, quote, uh, dealing with problems upstream. What that would mean in the current context of things is that we would be shoulder to shoulder with, uh, with the Americans um, and other allies in dealing with situations like Syria. Like, uh, like, um, uh, like potentially Iran. Um, and just coming back to the other point that I was making uh, earlier about uh, uh, a white paper. 
Um, in my estimation, a serious defense white paper would contradict uh, some of the government's most cherished positions right now. The government's position and the government's spending on the Arctic, as an example. Um, the, uh, uh, the government's uh, position in terms of uh, how it is uh, allotting funding for the construction of, of major warships um, in, in this country. Because the way that the warships are being apportioned, at least according to the plan now, is that uh, the Arctic offshore patrol ships will be the first warships off of the skids in Halifax. When the Navy has made it clear for over a decade that it needs its command and control destroyers, the tribal class destroyers, replaced imme like immediately. Um, I'm sure that you, you read about the, these uh, in some of the pieces I've written, some of the pieces of my colleagues, but essentially the backlog from Kandahar in terms of uh, defense projects, um, the one that breaks my heart is, is fixed-wing search and rescue aircraft. Um, that was first proposed in 2003-2004, and we have um, Buffalo aircraft flying in the, uh, in, in the west coast in the, Mount, in the Rockies doing search and rescue that uh, are almost as old as I am. I heard somebody say, wow. <laughs> Cy Cyclone helicopters, uh, the replacement for the Sea Kings. Um, uh, I write in uh, The Savage War extensively about my uh, outrage about how uh, the defense establishment was unable to deliver... Um, Chinook helicopters to Kandahar in a timely manner, and, it took, and how it took John Manley's in, uh, intervention to, uh, uh, to deliver it. Joint support ships, the, the, na the, the, the backbone of naval operations. Um, I, ha I have a friend who has served 31 years in the Navy. He has served the majority of those times on HM uh, the majority of that time on HMCS Preserver. He's been hanging in there putting off his retirement because he wants to commission one of the new joint support ships. And uh, I had to break the bad news to him recently that the project had been put off until 2018. Um, the uh, tribal class destroyer replacement, as I just mentioned, is uh, one of the Navy, as well the Arctic offshore patrol ships, which, uh, which I would consider to be a political pet project of uh, the current government, has also been put off until the 2017-2018 time frame. Now, I, I have to qualify that and say that uh, an awful lot, or some of those things, particularly the cyclone helicopters, really had nothing to do with Afghanistan and as much to do with the tinkering and Canadianization of, our, uh, of the aircraft. Uh, the F-35 I set aside because I, I think it's just a, an absolute flaming bag of poo all by itself and I'm sorry to put it that way but that's the only way to describe it especially if you would come to Ottawa and listen to some of the things that get said and some of the gyrations that, that happen um, essentially I would suggest to you that what you're seeing whenever you read an F-35 piece and whenever it's suggested this thing is completely off of the rails the government was trapped by its own rhetoric, for the most part. I can remember um, actually having a beer with uh, someone in uh, Julian Fantino's office in the fall of last year, and asking them, why in God's name did they tie themselves so tightly and make the rhetoric so strident where the F-35 was concerned? Because I pointed out to them, I had written a story earlier that year. The F-35, if it lives up to its billing, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to give Lockheed Martin the benefit of the doubt, but if the F-35 lives up to its billing, it will be absolutely one remarkable aircraft because it is run on software. The aircraft by itself has 10 million lines of software code for all the different functions, all the different things that it, that it does. Mostly it's uh, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance uh, uh, aspects to it. 
Um, when you include the logistics tail to it, it has 24 million lines of software code. As of February 2011, Lockheed Martin had only written 4 million of the 10 million lines of software code that were needed to power that aircraft. 4 million. That is, the code has not even been written, never mind been tested, never mind being tested, never mind having actually tested the aircraft under, uh, under combat conditions. Now, I mean, they have made strides since then. But the point that I was trying to make to the staffers in Julian Fantino's office was that you don't know if this aircraft is going to do what the manufacturer says it's going to do. So why are you being so unequivocal with it? And as far as I was concerned, they were trapped by their own rhetoric. You also, uh, I'm sure you're aware that there's shaky political support and shaky budgetary support for the aircraft south of the border. As I said, the aircraft is unproven in its design and testing. The time frame for this is very, very difficult for the CF-18s, which were extended in, uh, in the mid-2000s. Um, the end of their airframe life is around 2020. Now, that doesn't mean that CF-18s are going to start dropping out of the sky, just as the Sea Kings. The Canadian Forces has among some of the best aircraft maintainers in the world. But the fact remains is the fatigue life on the CF-18s gives it a finite lifespan. There is no backup plan. The government has no backup plan as that I know of right now. Other countries, such as Australia, have gone to a more sensible backup plan, which is they're going to buy some Super Hornets to at least transition. There's been no discussion of that. Um, the MOU... Uh, which binds all of the nations, the, the nine countries that are involved in the F-35 together, is an absolute stroke of evil brilliance on the part of the U.S. military-industrial complex. And it really is. And add to that, we have a very poisoned political environment. Um, <clears throat> just very quickly, the Arctic... Um, you know, we hear a lot about it, we talk a lot about it, but I've quoted General Walton Tinchuk on three occasions saying that there is no credible military threat in the Arctic right now. Um, yet, there are all these elaborate plans which are consuming a great deal of staff time and some money right now that are all behind schedule. I, uh, with the exception of the Arctic uh, Warfare Training Center uh, for the Army, uh, that seems to be... Um, motoring along. Uh, that is, uh, I was about to say Nana Civic. Nana Civic is, is the deep water port. That is in the Resident Bay area. Um, the Army, as I reported in the spring, is ill-equipped uh, for Arctic operations. They don't even have enough parkas um, to go around right now. Um, search and rescue, which ideally if you're going to assert sovereignty over uh, a particular area, um, or a particular um, piece of territory, search and rescue is, is natural. But the arrangements for search and rescue in, uh, in the Arctic uh, are, they're, it's mostly organized around commercial companies um, as opposed to uh, the, uh, the way it's organized in the south of Canada, which is around volunteer um, organizations. Now, I, re I recognize there's a, a population disparity, um, however, the, the plans do not seem to be very concrete. Um, the other thing, too, is that uh, um, just operation and maintenance or O&M funding for the North, uh, a 2008 study which I wrote about estimated that it would cost $780 million a year to uh, just to operate in the North the way the government had proposed in its initial Arctic strategy almost, and I would suggest that figure's almost up to about a billion dollars if they were to follow it. Um, that's an awful lot of money. Um, I question for what. Um, the March budget was very um, instructive. Uh, there wasn't a lot mentioned on defense, but I find that, that where there is silence, there is often a lot being said. 
Um, essentially, um, I'm sure all of you or many of you would be familiar that the government promised in 2008 to give the Canadian military stable and predictable funding. 1.2% uh, increase uh, every year until 2011 and then 2% every year preceding. Strangely, um, the government is you know, keeping up with that promise, they, but they're giving it with one hand and they're ripping it back with the other um, in terms of uh, asking for um, uh, cuts under uh, the Deficit Reduction Action Plan as well as the Strategic Review. Um, anyway, um, the cumulative effect of, uh, of these budget uh, increases, reductions, the, the, the shell game that goes on with all the money, uh, is that Canada's GDP uh, uh, defense spending will remain around 1.2%, um, which the Conservatives have criticized and said that it's not adequate, but that's where it's going to stay. Um, the government will tell you right now that the cumulative effect of their uh, of both DRAP and their strategic reviews is 1.5 billion dollars in cuts to a 20 uh, to a 20 billion dollar defense budget. Um, there are figures coming out from the uh, conference of defense associations in the next couple of weeks that will show that no, that's more like 2.5 billion when you when you take together the uh, uh, the two program reviews together. Um, and I can also tell you that D and D has been under incredible pressure to give up capabilities such as submarines. Um, my final thoughts about where defense policy is going um, in the next few years. Um, I would suggest to you that politically uh, the government's We Support the Troops uh, image is, has been making it much, much tougher to hold them to account for, uh, uh, for, their, uh, for, for what they're doing. Uh, the Liberals, uh, I'm speaking strictly as a journalist, the Liberals were a much easier target um, because they treated the Canadian military with benign neglect. Um, as I said before, the absence of a white paper um, makes it um, more likely that funds are going to be wasted on inefficient and pet projects. Um, I, I, th I think that uh, the government needs to come up with a white paper, justify its positions, on certain things, such as the F-35. Um, and I'm not saying that because I oppose the aircraft. I think it's a neat plane. I really do. But tell us what you're going to use it for. And the F-35 is a, not a first strike weapon, but it is a first day of war weapon. And it's it, in, its, in terms of its ability for continental defense, um, I mean, you heard a lot of debate lately about uh, the F-35, and it only, ha only has one engine. Well, I is that the appropriate aircraft yeah. when you're flying over the Arctic? And in terms of its, uh, in terms of its range, um, you know, it's not, it, it, it's not even as, as was pointed out, it's not even, the, uh, the Avro Arrow on paper had a greater range than uh, the, the F-35. Um, the, the politics, the poison politics of division uh, are going to make it much more difficult to reach a consensus on important issues of national security. And that politics of division is something I would suggest to you that has been, is, has been, is, is reasonably new. Uh, it, it, is, it is a creature of the polarized politics that this country has. And finally, I would suggest to you the legacy of care issues. Um, are going to be a huge lightning rod, and um, it could uh, overshadow future defense, like policy debate and policy matters. So that's where sort of where I see things going, and I'm at this point I'm happy to take any of your questions. Um, can I just uh, mention? I should have given this disclaimer at the beginning. This it, uh, this may be treated as a Privileged platform, or how do you want to handle this? Story? I have absolutely no problem being quoted on anything that I say because I, um, I yes, I do. I, 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 I live, I live and breathe this stuff, and no, and nothing that I have said to you folks here, I, I have not said either to the defense minister to his face or to his staff, or to uh, or to senior senior members of the Canadian military, or even ordinary soldiers. Um, I, I've always prided myself, especially in this, 
uh, uh, of calling it the way I see it. You may you may disagree with my perceptions, um, you know, but I I try to speak as plainly and as honestly because I think that the people who put on a uniform and who go into absolutely some of the worst places in the world deserve honesty and deserve somebody to actually say, okay, this is the way I see it. So. John. John. I guess it was, it was back in 1993 um, when you know, the, the Canadian military, the, the army was doing a lot more fighting in the former Yugoslavia than, you know, the nation of peacekeepers uh, mm -hmm. ideal would suggest. Uh, and um, we had uh, Captain uh, Mark Kennedy, who's mm -hmm. uh, writing for uh, the Garrison, a sort of defense newsletter in Ontario at the time, who mm -hmm. compiled a, a list of all of our casualties, all of our killed and wounded coming out of uh, uh, Bosnia and in Croatia and so on. And then suddenly started getting all the feedback saying, no, no, this guy didn't die in an accident. He, he died when the... Uh, an anti-tank uh, round hit his vehicle, and this guy wasn't accidentally shot, he was sniped. Yes, I, rem I, I, re I remember the controversy that oh, went yeah. with this, yes. Well, it just it sort of blew such shame. You know, it just, it doesn't change. Yeah. And by the way, Kennedy is still a captain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sir. Uh, moving forward, uh, you were talking about the desire to revert back to peacekeeping, or as it now seems to be peacemaking. And there was this big discussion uh, by the politicians about being in the UN uh, peacekeeping efforts in Africa, mm. Congo, Sudan, all these places where I don't think we ever want to go, mm -hmm. but for political reasons and whatever, uh, we might, our politicians might entertain sending our people there. Mm -hmm. What's the feeling on the political side and what's the feeling on the military side about the possibility or the practicality of doing such well, a mission? Well, I would suggest to you, first of all, the current government um, holds the United Nations largely in contempt. Um, I would suggest that uh, if there is going to be any future military deployments, um, it will be in the capacity of um, coalitions of the willing, if I can use that really, really well-worn phrase, um, uh, but or, but also too um, under under the guise of humanitarian disasters, such as, for example, Haiti. Um, I don't see Canada getting involved in too many. Uh, peacekeeping missions, um, uh, especially under the UN flag in the next little while, under this particular government. Eric. Um, taking a couple of your points, the continued perception that peacekeeping is more desirable and uh, the probable predilection of the government for getting involved in non-conflict scenarios in the future. Um, also the fact that you said that Afghanistan was the most political uh, intervention, politically driven intervention in a long time. Um, what is your take on Lang and Stein's thesis that the war in Kandahar was completely unforeseen and unpredicted? And secondly, what would you rate the chances of another one going off the edge that's supposed to be humanitarian? <laughs> uh, Eric, you're a cruel man, because I think, <laughs> I, I, I think you know my opinion of, uh, of, of, of that book. Um, look, there was, as I chronicle here, um, in my estimation, there was an abdication of responsibility on the part of the government to do its homework about the Kandahar deployment. Um, becoming more involved in the world, showing a more muscular policy was one of Paul Martin's laundry list of things that he wanted to accomplish while he was in office. Uh, passing gay marriage, um, you know, doing all of these other things. If you look at the, at the political list at the time, the debate that sent, and I was saying this upstairs when we were on the roof, the debate that sent Canadian troops 
into Kandahar that had essentially sent Canadian troops to war in the toughest province in Afghanistan. <clears throat> the only public debate that occurred, because Cabinet had already made this decision, occurred on a Tuesday night at 7 o'clock, about 10 days before the Martin government was defeated in the Commons. It was a take notes debate. There was no vote on it. The decision by Cabinet, because, I mean, that is our system. Cabinet has the executive authority to, uh, to deploy troops into, uh, into harm's way. Um, that decision was taken not in Parliament, not after debate. It was taken in the ballroom of a Winnipeg hotel during one of Paul Martin's uh, traveling cabinet road shows at the end of 2005. That's when, they, that's when they held the debate. I argue in here, and I've argued publicly, that the people who put on the uniform, the people who got shot at, the people who uh, were killed, the people who were wounded, deserved much more of a public airing. They deserved the public to pay attention to what was going on. But it was designed politically not to draw any attention to it. And um, the Conservatives have since made any deployment of combat troops a matter of uh, a vote in Parliament. And I say, good on them. Um, there is some question about whether or not the training mission in Afghanistan should be considered a combat deployment. The government didn't consider it as such, even though it is, I can tell you from my own experience and my own research, especially with the upswing in activity by the Haqqani network in Kabul, um, is, is dangerous. And especially when you consider the green on blue or the insider attacks that have been, uh, that have been taking place. So I see the matters being debated in public, which is better. I also saw actually a very, very encouraging sign um, in the selection of the new Chief of Defense Staff that uh, took place and you saw probably saw a great deal of speculation uh, that happened. But um, the government actually went through a very rigorous, formal interview process. This all happened behind the scenes. And um, I find that very encouraging, and I, I actually I, I'm echoing um, Douglas Bland uh, from Queens, whom I have a lot of respect for. But I mean, he basically said that shows how engaged and detail oriented um, the government is. Not to suggest that in the past uh, the selection of the country's top military commander um, was you know done by you know a draw of straws, um, but there's obviously much more thought being put into it. The ch so therefore, I think that the chances of us stumbling into another conflict are pretty, are, are pretty remote. Mario, over here. I'm sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to ask. Uh, I assume that when we went into Afghanistan that we had a plan that we were going to achieve something. And what have we achieved? Um, you would be amazed at how thin that plan was. Um, I love quoting uh, uh, Bill Graham, defense minister at the time, who um, had what I consider to be the best line about uh, Canar, and I have a great deal of respect for Bill Graham anyway. Um, he was actually one of the more, one of the most thoughtful defense ministers that we had. But, you know, he essentially said that, that, that the, uh, the combat mission, or the mission in Kandahar, uh, was, going to be, uh, a li was going to be a little tougher uh, than the one in Kabul, they were they were going to go in and kill a few bad guys, and make love to the natives by handing out, um, you know, development projects and and, and stuff. Um, I would suggest to you that if you read into some of the research and into some of the planning that went into Kandahar, I mean, the Canadian military was spot on in terms of uh, in terms of preparing itself and you know becoming ready because. The, um, the, the commander of the army uh, toured Kandahar in, uh, two, in the summer of 2005 and came back and said, we need armored patrol vehicles, we need the LAVs up armored, and we need better, more accurate artillery. And um, the, so the, the military was 
properly preparing itself for what it for what it was expecting. But in terms of a whole of government plan, which is what we, it, which is the the mantra that we heard about, you know, all throughout the mission. This is a diplomatic development and uh, you know and defense mission, 3D. Uh, the the planning was. Have we achieved? It? Come back and ask me that in five years. I'm not. I'm not dodging your question, and I don't mean. I don't mean to do that. But I. I. I'll honestly say that. I cannot say at this time whether we have or not. Can the Canadian Army and the Canada stepped away from the battlefield, stepped away from what it did in Canada. It handed responsibility for its legacy over to the United States and to the Afghans. Whether they're going to be able to complete that, whether they're going to be, or whether it's going to go completely off the rails is totally out of our hands. And one, go ahead. One more question. Then what does the military believe? What percentage of the GDP do we have to spend to create a military that is credible? Well, our military is credible for the amount of money that we, that we spend on it. I would suggest you ask anybody in uniform and you ask anybody who does any amount of defense research, NATO standard is 2%. The United States spends approximately 4.3% of its GDP on its military. But roughly 2% so is... So it's not a lot more. In billions of dollars terms, we should, we should be spending about $30 billion. I mean, that they, to meet the NATO standard, but you have, you have governments that you know, say that there are, there are like other priorities, right? And... I mean, I'm not sitting here and advocating for, for, for more funds for the military. That's, NA that's NATO standard. I, I would suggest to you that before they start spending 2% of GDP, the money that they do have shouldn't be you know, spent on pet projects. It should be spent in a rational manner. Um, I'd like you to talk for a minute on the constraints and restraints on our journalists over there. It seems to me that it changed during the life of the mission. Early on, they had to stay within the wire and report on ramps and everything, not do much more. And then it, there were more, more allowances made later for wider reporting to tell the whole story. What, what was your experience with that? Well, uh, actually, I, I'll, I'll disagree with you about the timeline as to how things unfolded, because I had much more freedom in 2006 to report on what was going on than I did as it came to a close. Now, as you would see if you if you read, um, my publisher tells me I have to do these things, right? Um, but uh, I'm told, and I'm, I'm also, to be honest with you, I'm not very good at self-promotion. But um, the way you'll see that the way that we covered the war there, as I was explaining in the beginning. It wasn't perfect. It, it, it was a hybrid. Ideally, journalists would not want to be living at a military camp under the protection of the military. Um, we would prefer to be independent. We would prefer to be reporting. But the security situation in Kandahar did not allow for that to happen. So what eventually ended up happening was that Kandahar, for the Canadian media, which the Canadian media essentially went to Kandahar and camped there um, in rotations, for five years. And um, the way that it developed was that we felt an obligation, rightly so, to cover the other side of the conflict, not the troops. Now, when I say the other side of the conflict, I don't mean the Taliban. I'm talking the Afghan people, the people that we were there supposed to be helping. So the, the way it developed was that um, if the story that particular day happened to be with the Canadian military, if the military came to you and said, we have an operation that's taking place, you got to go out with the troops. No worries. Strap on the flak jacket, the helmet, button up in the lav, away we go. And you're gone for a day, two days, three days, ten days. Um, sometimes you'd end up going out and you'd be camping out at forward operating bases with the troops or you'd be in combat outposts. The other side of that is if the story that day happened to be an Afghan story, a story in Kandahar City, 
we would dress in Afghan clothes. We would put on a shower kameez and and uh, and a hat, and we would. We, and each news agency had local fixers, local uh, local journalists, who would act as fixers, drivers, and translators. And they would come to the front gate. We would disembed ourselves, and then we would go into Kandahar City. That's that's how we covered it. We would go in unarmed, um, and that at times, I, I, to be honest with you, like I, I actually felt more comfortable traveling unembedded than I did being embedded. Um, but it was more nerve wracking to travel unembedded because you were essentially dodging the Taliban. And as you can tell, I don't necessarily blend in, um, you know, in Kandahar. So at the beginning of the war, we had much more freedom to be able to do that. You could just like walk on and walk off, you know, the base. I mean, you let the public affairs officers know and, you know, you clear it with the guards and you, you know, you go out the front gate. But um, the longer the war went on, the more difficult it became. Um, yeah, Melissa Fung, you're probably familiar with Melissa Fung having been kidnapped. She was kidnapped during one of those um, unembedded stints. Um, uh, mind you, she was in Kabul. She was not in, uh, or she was south of Kabul. She was not in Kandahar. Um, and then, of course, I'm sure you're all familiar with the fact that uh, Michelle Lang uh, was, was killed in a, in a roadside bombing. And that created a number of contortions that actually, in my estimation, limited the coverage. Because what you ended up seeing is you ended up seeing uh, uh, television reporters, um, you know, coming into Kandahar and essentially sitting at the base waiting for ramp ceremonies. I realized that that was something that, you know, was an image that was fostered by um, the political establishment and to a, less, to a lesser degree um, the, the senior military leadership that, like right from the beginning, that all they, all they were interested in was ramp ceremonies and they didn't, you know, meanwhile, I mean, I'm out there getting my ass shot off, right, you know, in the middle of an ambush, you know, and being told, no, no, you just stay at the base, don't you? Um, so um, the longer the war went on, the more the restrictions that were placed on, on the Canadian media by their desks, by insurance uh, matters. Well, that's I was where were the restrictions coming yeah, from? Yeah, yeah, and um, it came down to right at the end, I'm very proud to say, I'm very, very proud of the fact that I'm a Canadian press journalist because, and that's one of the reasons why I put that on the front of the book cover is because we were the only ones without any caveats at the end. We still went out. We still went into Kandahar City. The day that Ahmad Wali Karzai was killed, I was standing outside the funeral. All right? the, um, the day that the, uh, the flag came down at Massamgar, you know, where so much Canadian blood has been spilled, I was standing there. So, and, and, and I, I can honestly say that right at the end, very few of my colleagues were able to do that. And that's not to disparage the, the, the coverage of anyone else, because, I mean, I, I, I will bow down to anybody who um, put themselves in that sort of position from a media point of view, because um, we did it... We don't get any tax breaks. We don't get any medals. We didn't get, uh, and, and in many cases, like, you know, we didn't get any, uh, like, when I say recognition. We don't do it for recognition. We do it mostly, we do it for the public good. We do it to inform the public. But, um, you know, and there are a number of my colleagues, to, to be honest with you, who have come back and who suffer even to this day. And I'm talking Canadian press correspondents, I'm talking people that work at other news organizations, that the war is going to haunt them forever. And, you know, and, and as, as one soldier pointed out to me, he said, you know, he says, I really feel bad for you guys. He says, because y you don't have the same kind of support system, you know, that, that, that we have when they come home. But, I mean, I will say, I mean, and I, I come back to the, uh, when I say the Canadian press, the Canadian press... Our system of caring for correspondents over time evolved and improved to the point where there was pre-deployment medical screening and post-deployment medical screening 
for all the correspondence that went through uh, that went through that. So the coverage evolved. It, it, it wasn't perfect. You got. I mean, you didn't get a complete and accurate picture. It's like I mean, I described it. It's like it was. It was like a lot of times it was like looking through a straw, trying to cover this thing. And I, the only complaint that I have about the media, to be perfectly honest, and I'll end it here, by, is by saying that there were not enough of us on the ground. There needed to be more. One last question. Sir? Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm interested in the wealth and the width of your knowledge. Thank you, sir. On the basis of my occupation in Afghanistan over 15 years, I was a little disappointed you didn't tell me more until you answered that question about the locals. How did the farmer up at Estella feel? What was the effect of our presence there, aside from the military, etc.? I was interested in your talk about counterinsurgency, and you realized, and I realized, General Braddock, Braddock never learned anything about counterinsurgency, and we're still in the same boat because it changes every minute. And the train for counterinsurgency is really not that adequate. I wonder, too, whether the, when the next thing comes along, if we're really prepared to look at it. I know when you had the meetings at the Military Institute, and all sorts of people in there get laying out all the elaborate plans which we're going to do, feminine, uh, feminine uh, liberation, more schools, etc., etc. If you happen to put up your hand and say, I don't believe it, people shunned you for the next 30 days. Yes. You weren't allowed to speak up. There was an enthusiasm to get into war. I remember one old colonel uh, <laughs> saying, I'm glad we're back in the game. And that's what it amounted to. Terrible, it wasn't you. No, thank you. <laughs> but I really wonder, as a, an ending, has this really been, uh, we don't have any choice in the future? Is, are we like the guy who's in a small town and he loses every week at poker? Every week he loses. Hmm. His wife says to him, is he going out to play poker? She says, you know you're going to lose at poker. Why are you going out? He says, well, it's the only game in town. <laughs> That's what it amounts to. Is this the only game in town we've got? We keep up with all this, all the argument about aircraft, about more uh, ships, etc. We do that because the only game in town, or we really got a real plan to go forward. I'm sorry to be so diffuse in my statement. Oh no, no, no. That's fine. Um, well, part of the reason that I that I didn't talk very much about uh, about the Afghans and or even really about Kandahar was that when the initial discussions that we had about like, what are you going to talk about, I, the, the theme to me, I, was, as it conveyed to me, was like the, the Canadian military kind of like going forward. Um, the other, and I was quite happy with that because I'm trying to encourage but, uh, um, but uh, you'll, you'll find a lot of, uh, uh, I say a lot of my opinions are, are in there, but in a nutshell, I was very disappointed because the the political narrative halfway through the war became instead of thumping the terrorism button and saying that we're there to fight uh, you know uh, terrorism it became we're there to help the Afghan people which is much more politically palatable to the Canadian public than than terrorism I mean, Canadians don't feel threatened by terrorism even after the Toronto 18 um, you know people just didn't you know, it, it, it just, it's, it's somebody else's problem. It's not ours. And, I mean, that's why I think uh, the, the Conservatives are making a, a tone-deaf argument. But when it came to helping the Afghan, uh, Afghan people, um, I will say that we are too smart by half. Because I, I talk in here about how we essentially went in and said to the Afghan people on the development side, what do you need? What can we do for you? And I know I'm boiling it down to, uh, boiling some very complex government policy down to a very, a very simple basis, but um, the Canadian military conducted public opinion surveys, if you can get this, on the streets of Kandahar all through the combat mission, right up until the end. How do people feel about the uh, foreign troops? What do they need? What, what you know, and those surveys from early spring 2007 
consistently came back and said the number one concern, the number one priority of people in Kandahar was jobs and the economy. The second thing was electricity. We need a stable supply of electricity. And then the third thing was security. Um, but that kind of bounced in and out of the third spot. It could be replaced here and there. What did we give them? We gave them irrigation, which was moved between number 8 and number 12 on their list of what they needed. We gave them health care through the polio uh, program and education, which bounced between number 7 and number 8 in terms of where they saw it. I can remember sitting, and, and I recounted in here, in the living room of the, um, for want of a better expression, this gentleman uh, by the name of Haji Kuzim was the um, head of the local chamber of commerce. He was the head of the Kandahar Industrial Association, which uh, was a, a very loose association of business people with all these sort of mom and pop industries throughout uh, uh, throughout the city. And you know, he said to me, he says, "You people, he says, don't understand the importance." of electricity, because the electricity was on in Kandahar, not only for lights and power, but for pumping water wells, two hours a day, at that time in 2008. And he said, do you realize the number of businesses that are closed because of the absence of, of stable electricity? And he leaned forward to me, he spoke very good English. He leaned forward to me and he said, do you realize, he said, that I could put 6,500 people to work, he says, or the businesses in this city could put 6,500 people to work tomorrow just in the existing businesses that have been boarded up. He said, if we had stable electricity. And then he, he, his finger went right, almost right to my nose and he said, those are 6,500 people, he says, that wouldn't be shooting at you tomorrow. And... Um, I, I just, again, I'm, I'm boiling very complex government policy down to a very simple statement, but we went in, we asked them, what do you need? They told us what they needed, and we delivered something else. So, um, what's, the, what's the, 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 the attitude of the, the Afghan people? Um, they, they're, they're very appreciative uh, of the assistance. They, they always were, even being a very proud people. But the longer that this thing dragged on, the more it became a pox on all of your houses. At the end, it was like, you, you could see it. I mean, I was in a place called Zangabat. Um, people were just, they were tired of the, having foreign troops there. They were tired of the Taliban. It was like, will all of you just please go home? And I would suggest to you that that, that, that attitude um, is like is sort of the prevailing sentiment that that, that sticks with me. You know, um, I'm sorry, I like I, we wouldn't have we wouldn't have we have more time to talk about it. Um, and unfortunately, if you got me talking about this, we would be here for dinner. So. Right, that was a very rich uh, presentation. It, it brings to mind so many things that we can uh, talk about the future security studies uh, luncheons. Um, I think it was a great synopsis of where we are right now. Thank you. Um, the issues, we're all pretty much realists in this room by virtue of the very fact that you're in this room discussing and listening to uh, and partaking in, a, um, in this subject matter uh, rather than being idealists. And uh, it always comes down to the basic questions. And, uh, you know, how much is enough? When and how do we commit? Uh, you look back at great Canadian statesmen that said, to, that say, we live in a fireproof house. Uh, our geopolitical situation is such that um, pretty much everything we do militarily and security wise is discretionary because of our geopolitical situation. Now, since all these things were said and have been in 
embedded in national security studies programs at uh, defense colleges and uh, that uh, some of us are still uh, embedded in. Uh, the world has changed and uh, security has come home. We talk of the Toronto 18 uh, and all of that. We talk of the myth of uh, peacekeeping and how that's still pervasive. And, um, you know, uh, whenever Canada loses, whenever any nation's at war, uh, we get wobbly at the knees. And, of course, any poll will say, well, we don't want to be there. Uh, but, again, it gets down to those, those questions of uh, uh, when do we commit? How do we commit? Why do we commit? And those things, as much as you embed a process and develop a process, a, a checklist, uh, if you read uh, Colin Powell's uh, uh, book, uh, which in, in some ways takes Clausewitz, and uh, Clausewitz, of course, has his, had his little checklist on when do you commit, you know, it's got to be a vital national interest, etc., etc., etc. Those lists are fine to have, but governments around the world don't adhere to a checklist on when do you commit your uh, precious blood and resources. And especially when they come home and they're interred uh, in, uh, in uh, church cemeteries, as we've seen. Um, other issues that come up, we've passed the stage of a the threat-based planning process strategically in any military design for future <coughs> operations. And the reason I bring this up is uh, because you touched upon uh, the shopping list of, of items. The SAR requirement, uh, the, the Arctic uh, equipping program, uh, putting in place a, a forward operating base up north. Um, there is no threat up there, but under capability-based planning, which has replaced threat environment planning, where you actually had a threat, we don't have a threat now. So we need to sit down and what the government needs to do, and government does, and perhaps this is a presentation I'll give sometime in the future about this process, where you take some scenarios, of which there are 11 or 12 that the government uh, plays with, and then you prioritize those scenarios as what's most likely, least likely. Then you attach to it the resourcing requirements. Then you do a little risk analysis, and you determine which one of these things you want to fund and deliver. Search and rescue up north is is a, a pretty high priority. The rhetorical question is why is it so low on the scale? Now, I know for a fact that the search and rescue with centers in Trenton, Victoria, and in Halifax have no idea that the of how many helicopters are in, in the Arctic. There, there's about at any given day there's about 1,700 helicopters and fixed wing aircraft operating up there. The military has no common operating picture of where these planes are and how to use them and use them uh, uh, to, to assist in search and rescue. And that's just one example that I'm giving you. Um, I'm conscious of the fact that we have some former CTV people in the room. Um, and next, I think, Saturday night or Sunday night in the Fifth Estate, the former ADM material, Alan Williams, who has spoken in the Institute, is going to talk about the F-35. So if you're interested in hearing more about all the pitfalls of the F-35, which, which you've touched upon, uh, these are all concerns that we all have, just, just from a straight taxpayer point of view. Um, if I was uh, Second Lieutenant Jimmy, uh, Jimmy Bob III, uh, strapped into a $85 million, $90 million plane, uh, flying somewhere in, over in the Arctic, I'd be concerned about only having one engine. Then I'd be truly concerned about, is anyone going to rescue me uh, up there in that environment? Another, uh, we are members of the Canadian Defense Association and Institute, so, uh, so we collaborate in some degree as to, to the reports that they put up. Uh, you mentioned the CDAI. Um, Another thing that is concerning and uh, is the fact that we have really no national security plan or program. Separate from a Department of Defense military white paper. And uh, so that's that overarching program that is meant to bring all of the other government departments together. And I'm, I'm going to close on that, the whole concept of 
are we any further ahead with the whole of government approach based upon our experience over the last 10, 12 years? I, I don't know. I've been watching it. I've been teaching it. I've been uh, involved in the process in Ottawa where we had all these silos of minis ministries, with each with their deputy ministers. And prior to our Afghanistan experience, these deputy, there were certain pigs more equal than others. And the deputy minister of defense was definitely way, really down here. Okay, and then we saw this shift by virtue of resourcing and the fact that we were at war. The deputy minister and the minister of national defense took the lead. It was in the spotlight on a daily basis. Where was foreign affairs? Foreign affairs slipped down in in the list of uh, of, uh, of those that we're uh, uh, most uh, affectionate with. There, I think there's a lot of saber rattling in Ottawa right now that these ministries, ministers, deputy ministers in the public service that were relegated to a lower status in the last ten years, they're going to get back in the game. And D and D will slide back down in the scale of of influence, and uh, so that'll be something to watch. And I don't know what your tone or your uh, your view of that, but I think that's uh, it's uh, what is it? Deja vu all over again. Uh, take us back 12 years to uh, see that reflected in our, in our funding reductions and number reduction. And, boils down as a realist is uh, things we do are discretionary and uh, how much is enough and when do we commit and how do we commit and those decisions are politically made on traveling as you mentioned I found that uh, interesting um, a traveling road shows by the then minister in a sound bite the last thing our prime minister has more power more discretionary power than any other under the Westminster system than the president of the United States we have no checks and balances except every four years when there's an election. But the Prime Minister and the Westminster system can make these decisions on his own. And um, so that gives you a little bit more basis on why some of these uh, uh, decisions may, may, in fact, really be uh, uh, decisions based upon politics. It's all about politics. So. Um, Murray, can you step forward, please? Um, and what we're going to do is we'll, we'll set up some books over here for Murray to sign and for you to purchase them. And uh, I don't know what we're going to tell them before. Oh, what? Uh, 25. 25. Okay, yes, that's good. Because the, uh, well, the list price is $34.95. So we'll do that. Um, I know that the... My ties. And, well, thank you to, uh, to uh, in our appreciation for coming today and for being with us and enlightening us uh, on all of these issues and giving us some good food for thought. So we look forward to continuing to read your good words and fight the good fight. Thanks. On behalf of the RCMI, this is Eric Morse saying thank you for listening to us today. Watch for announcements of future event transcripts, and we hope that you will be able to join us in person for our regular speakers' events. Once again, thank you for tuning into our podcasts, and have a wonderful day.